And we are freaking live here on Gutter Fighting Secrets Tactical Podcast. We're coming at you today with my man, Derek. Derek, we're going to leave his last name out of this just for OPSEC sake. But Darren is a uh, former U.S. Army infantryman, current executive protection agent officer, whatever acronym you like. Uh, his resume is actually pretty official. Six years EP specialist for private business clients and music management. Five years to present analyst consultant investigator for a PI firm. Uh, three years to present PSO, PSS for a major U.S. based security defense contractor. Two years combined of other security specialists and coordinating positions. And one year as a live tester. Get this, guys, for a body armor company. A live tester for a body armor company, which. Dude, you're fucking insane for that. But welcome on to the podcast, man. Pleasure to have you on. Thanks for coming. Hey, thanks, brother. Good to be here, man. And as far as the uh, body armor testing stuff, I was usually the shooter and never wore it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but well, yeah. that's more like my style, man. Like, <laughs> <laughs> We always found the crazy Marines to wear the armor, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah, but in between uh, chewing on crayons, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Derek, we've got a lot to talk about tonight, man. You and I were um, getting acquainted kind of in the comment section of one of my videos. I know we've talked back and forth about geopolitics and some of the live streams that we've been doing. Yep. And uh, it immediately impressed me kind of the depth of your knowledge about geopolitics. I told you up front, I'm, I was convinced that you were, you know, uh, some government man or something like that. But you swear to me that you're not. Either way, even if you were, I will never know. So, <laughs> um, I want to get right to this, man, and then we'll kind of circle back around. But a lot of people right now are just chomping at the bit. What do you think about Russia and the Ukraine? Oh, man, that's a whole bear, too, because, I mean, I, I know um, I know people that live in the Ukraine. And uh, actually, a buddy of mine went to Russia for a year to teach English and music. Um, right around the time the Crimea stuff actually started kicking off a couple of years ago. Um it's really interesting because, um, I mean, you're seeing right now, presently, you're seeing this buildup of equipment, personnel and everything going on trains down to the peninsula and everything. And the Russians are claiming that it's, you know, just for a joint exercise right there, you know, the Black Sea and everything. But um, I mean, with with how they've been infiltrating conventional Russian military units in Ukraine, apart from the militias that um, they've been employing and then Wagner Group. Their, their private security company. Um, it, it's dynamically very, uh, very gray as far as that goes. There's a lot of grays there. Um, it's obvious that like FSB and some of those other Russian agencies and, and direct Russian military units are in Ukraine and directly supplying the, the separatists and rebel groups, militia groups, whatever you want to call them, in the peninsula. And uh, you're you're just seeing more and more equipment showing up in Ukraine and just increased aggression. I mean, there's the last couple of years, you've seen these periods of six months at a time where there's not quite been a ceasefire. There's still been rocket attacks and stuff, but you haven't seen the firefights like you did with taking the Luhansk airport and, and things like that. So um, with with this buildup, it's definitely raising some concerns. I mean, even even, you know, NATO is is starting to raise some eyebrows and go, Hey, what's going on here? Russians can say one thing and then do another as Russians like to do. Not going to hold it against them per se, you know? Um, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, it, it doesn't make them look good. It doesn't make them look good at all. And uh, I mean, uh, Ukraine's going to get real hot again too. Uh, I think that's, I think that's something that's really going to, uh, to escalate. And not to mention on the Ukrainian side of things, you've got U.S. military doing joint training ops with them, and you've got private companies there uh, training Ukrainian uh, forces apart from providing equipment and things like that. And then you have outside volunteers. Um, and presently, the Ukrainian setup for that is uh, not quite a conscription, but it's something like that. They're trying to rein in the actual volunteer units and fold them into the Ukrainian military. So if you go there as a volunteer from say the United States or Canada, um, if 
you know, if everything's like copacetic and you don't have any warrants or anything to have to get extradited back here to the U.S. or whatever, you can join the Ukrainian military and they'll actually give you Ukrainian citizenship. So you become a dual citizen after I want to say it's like two years of service or something like that. So that's kind of the setup that they're going with to kind of rein in the volunteer uh, groups and all the foreign fighters coming in. So um, it, it's very dynamically interesting on both sides of the spectrum, you know, and Croatia, Croatia did the same thing back during the uh, Yugoslav Serbian war. So, hmm. yeah, it really fell off my radar for a long time, man, for a long while you didn't hear anything about Ukraine. You were hearing a little bit about Palestine. You're he hearing a little bit about a lot about China, but Ukraine yeah. seemed to have just dropped off the radar completely. It, it, and again, it was kind of one of those lulls, so to speak. But thankfully, there are a couple of reporters, um, or freelance and otherwise, that have stayed embedded, kind of on the Ukrainian side in the whole conflict. And uh, you see occasional like France 24 broadcasts or something kind of detailing things. So they just recently, well, in the last like two years or whatever, we're talking about FSB uh, snipers operating in, in Ukraine um, and just things like that. It's, it's been, it's been little skirmishes and engagements, a lot of like recon operations and things like that. Um, and, and rocket attacks. That's really what it's been. Um, you haven't seen a lot of, larger scale direct engagement like what you were seeing kind of early on so and that's that's why it seemed quiet you know everyone's well at least the russian side's trying to keep it as hush hush as possible but you know again you know foreign reporters and and invested reporters and other uh, other just general public kind of have the opportunity to uh put some footage out there every once in a while so yeah. Now, what do you what do you think is Russia's end goal with this? I mean, do you think that they're going to incur a little bit, a couple miles into the border and stop eventually, or do you think that they kind of want to take Ukraine? That's uh, it's really hard to say without uh, that. That is really hard to say. I don't. I. I it's all speculation for me sure. uh, with that. I really don't know. I mean. They, they could do a number of things. They could they could hold the area that they have now because they, now they have a much more direct route to the Black Sea and stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, for means for their uh, naval naval purposes and, and things like that, it, just as much as uh, tourism, trade and commerce as well. Um, they just built that big bridge in the Crimean Peninsula too. Mm -hmm. um, something like a 13 mile long bridge in sections. Um, along the peninsula. So and that was something that they were kind of showcasing there for a minute. So I, I, I think there's several motives motives to it. And then a, apart from that, I have no idea. I mean, it doesn't, from everything that Putin has said, it doesn't seem like he wants to reinstate the Soviet Union, which would be taking over a bunch of other countries. Um, but at the same, there's, there's some elements of that mindset from from back then that are kind of showing themselves again as much as they want to become much more uh, open free market and, and everything much like a lot of the other Western countries. So it, it's really hard to say. It's really hard to say. There's a lot of dynamics there that just make it confusing and, and leave a lot, you know, open and in, in the air for subjective uh, subjective translation you know so it's <laughs> excuse me it's hard to say it really is it really is i mean russia's got their fingers on a lot of things too i mean they're using wagner group all over the world now uh namely in africa mm. um mm. um so i mean they're they're trying to maintain some some stability for their infrastructure and their economy and everything too but also kind of showing that hey they're still a powerhouse in in the global theater for you know uh, political military might and things like that so yeah it's it's difficult to see what's going on in putin's head i mean even our analysts i don't think fully understand yet what the real intention here is could be wrong but that's just the impression yeah. i get oh it's it's certainly hard i mean the, the dude's a former spy so <laughs> you know he's, he's got some he's got some uh he's got some some tips and tricks up his sleeves to uh, kind of keep a uh, stoic 
stoic wall up, you know? So. Yeah, he's very good at the Russians are very good at that in general. They're icy yep. people. Yeah, they are. They are. Now, um, I just want to briefly ask you if you followed that Azerbaijan Armenia thing at all while we're in Eastern Europe. Uh, I did. I did a little bit. Yeah. Um, that uh, I mean, that's been an ongoing conflict, uh, you know, here and there. Back in the back in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a conflict over especially over that same kind of centralized province that's directly on the border between the two countries. And uh, I mean, it's it's been sparking up on and off, you know, since what, probably the 1800s, if not before, right. when the Ottoman Empire was still around. But I mean, there were still conflicts going on there. So um, it, that's just one of those. This is one of those cyclical things. Just like just like with recently, you know, it's been resolved. Guess what? Russia has shown up to do some peacekeeping, um, peacekeeping and kind of maintain um, uh, stability as, as far as uh, border crossing and things like that, mostly from the Azerbaijani side. But, you know, it, it's that that was interesting, too, because, uh, yeah, it's just it's been a disputed territory for for centuries now. So <clears throat> and then you've got little pockets of ethnic Azerbaijanis that are kind of isolated in Armenia and vice versa. You have ethnic Armenians isolated in these small uh, regional towns, villages, and kind of surrounding land in Azerbaijan too. And then, and then a whole area um, that was, that shared the border. So yeah, they've, they've always been trading it off. So, and I don't, I don't, I don't foresee them not fighting over it again at some time in the future too, you know? So Azerbaijan just seems to have a little bit more support from Russia and Turkey and, uh, and then having uh, forward fighters from Syria and stuff come into the country. So it's a really interesting kind of alliance that's taking place here, man. Um, I don't know how many of our uh, viewers out there kind of are also into the biblical eschatology things, but it does mention at one point in the Bible, kind of these five or six nations that we're seeing all buddying up together. And it, uh, it's just it's just curious to see all of these things coming together. Yep, it really is. It really is. I agree. Now you mentioned um, Ukraine, and I want to throw this question in there for you too, because I know you know a lot about stateside policy as well. Um, Joe Biden, right, um, our current president, and um, so he's got some happenings with Ukraine, right? Uh, what do you yep. think is going to go on between us and the Ukraine as far as for foreign policy? kind of goes uh, that's a good question i mean the clinton said some dealings with uh, the russians and the ukrainians too back in the day but um as far as far as as far as biden and that i mean through jen what's her name the circle bag lady his uh his his public affairs lady they haven't really made any statements on whether they've kind of talked to even nato about anything they haven't brought anything up in that regard which is interesting confusing uh i don't really know how to put it you know i mean joe doesn't really seem that all put together uh <laughs> in in regards to uh making some some uh smart but snap decisions when necessary for that kind of thing so um i don't know if uh his stated drawback out of afghanistan means that he's going to reappropriate forces to nato and to europe for that i don't know if you know, he's he's going to uh, offer more funding and equipment to the Ukrainians. Uh, it, it, it's hard to say because they've, they've said nothing about it, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Chances are pretty high. They've not discussed it either. I mean, I've looked at his schedule a few times and it's lighter than mine when I'm on vacation. So, <laughs> right. I don't know. And actually, they just put out a statement today saying that uh, what Biden says does not reflect the policy of the Biden administration. So... <laughs> Yeah. Yikes. Yeah. Um, it's, that just, uh, you know, between that and then what, 30 Democrats coming out and uh, requesting that Biden not be uh, get responsible for the nuclear codes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's it's a heck of a time that we live in right now. That, that That's it's it's disturbing. That's for sure. There's so much there's so much discord and obvious obvious fracturing within not only their party politically, but also between these various agencies and departments and, and in Congress and everything. It's, 
it kind of reminds me almost a little bit like uh, back during right when Afghanistan and Iraq kicked off in 01, um, you had you had like the, the DOD and the State Department were butting heads in the sibling rivalry. Um, nobody was really on the same page, you know, for the, like three years. Um, it was messy. It was very messy. And, and we're seeing that again in a different way, but we're seeing that kind of thing again where everybody's trying to maintain some, some semblance of control and trying to come out on top and show that, hey, they can, they can do this. And they can handle this. And these these guys over here, they can't, you know. Yeah. So it's it's just a lot of competition that's unnecessary uh, uh, in that fracturing and not not putting the president in full control of presidential powers, but giving him presidential powers for other things like executive orders uh, is is disturbing, to say the least. You know, the, the, there's no trust there. There's no trust there. No, and, no, there's not. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, agendas are running right. So now I don't want to put you on the spot here any more than I already have. But I mean, we see what's going on here, you know, stateside with the fence around the Capitol building, all of that stuff. I was just down in D.C. a couple of weeks ago talking with some of the guardsmen uh, about their feelings about it all, um, mm-hmm. you know, off the record. And uh, I don't think anyone's very happy about it. Now, as a former serviceman, what do you think about domestic deployments? Well, I mean, that's what the National Guard is for to an extent, obviously. They, a lot of the time it's more for, you know, uh, disaster response and, and whatnot, which is uh, part of what I do as, as a contractor when I'm on a domestic contract. But, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see that they've been extended to stay there and just sit around you know, uh, keeping an eye out on stuff at the Capitol. That's not really what the National Guard is for. Um, now that there's no rioting or anything going on, they, they should be sent back to their to, to their bases and to, uh, to their, uh, you know, homes of record and stuff. Um, there's no reason really for them to stay there like that um, on a domestic deployment there. It, it's Just wasteful, a lot of sense. wasteful, you know, monetarily and resource wise, it's wasteful, but also, I mean, there's, there's nothing going on. There's no reason for them to be there. Just, just in task and purpose. So. Yeah. yeah there's a lot of waste going on everywhere right now, unfortunately. Um, yeah. You know, so speaking about that, speaking about kind of the waste that's going on, um, the, the riots that are happening, I mean, I definitely want to get into kind of China and things like that with you. But before I hit that, let's just go in here so we can knock this off, man. Um, sure. All of the riots happening here. Now, you are an EP specialist, executive protection specialist, i.e. Yeah. bodyguard. You've been doing it for a long time. You know yep. a lot about it, dude. Um, yep. Can you give our guys and girls out there kind of any tips on <laughs> – Hey, listen, if you're, you know, around these riots, it's happening in your city, in your town, like what should people be thinking about kind of doing right now while there's still a lull between the spring and the, um, what I'm sure is going to be a hot summer. Yeah. Uh, that those, that's, that's a great, great topic to cover. Um, so not only do I do the executive protection, but I'm also a, a, uh, a protective security officer and a security specialist. So um, we deal with uh on contract we do deal with like facilities protection and and Mm. things like that apart from what i do protecting people so um if you live in a major city um when i say target hardening that doesn't necessarily mean what most people thinks it means in the conventional sense by what's been taught before putting up plywood really isn't going to do much to protect your windows plywood burns Bullets still go through plywood, things like that, you know? So it's just, don't make yourself stand out in any way if you can't help it, you know? So uh, wear neutral clothing. Don't don't really, you know, be wearing a MAGA hat or anything like that as as much as as it's your right and uh, a a great thing to be able to express yourself. Um, Doing those kinds of things, really, really keeping yourself under, under the radar, uh, visually and with activity is really the important thing. Be smart about your provisions, you know, have, have some cases of water at home and things like that in case, um, 
an incident happens or the city or whoever decides to uh, shut off power and water because that is a tactic that they can use to uh, uh, prevent ongoing activity from the, uh, the insurrectionists and the rioters and things like that. Um, just stuff like that. Uh, be smart about having al alternate routes of travel. If you have to stay in the city and, and move around, get to a grocery store and things like that, you know, um, don't try not to take main roads, especially roads around state capitals, uh, city courthouse buildings, things like that. Kind of stay away from those really congested foot traffic areas and areas where it's more inclined there's going to be rioter activity near police stations and things like that, courthouses. Um, just try and avoid those areas as much as you can. Um, but still go on, you know, doing your daily thing. It's just, you know, find alternate routes of travel to, uh, to take, you know, take, take the back roads. If, if you got to take, if you got to take an entire loop around the city to get to another point, do it, you know, be smart. Always have at least, you know, a half a tank or three quarters of a tank of gas in your vehicle. Um, you know, if you're going to be out and, uh, out and about driving and stuff. Um, and, uh, just make sure you have a means to protect yourself. <laughs> That's the other one. Yeah. Whether it's uh, whether you're carrying a firearm, uh, a, a blade, a flashlight with a crown on it, you, you jack someone in the face, a baton, pepper spray, uh, taser if it's legal uh, in your state, you know, just things like that. You know, have have something with you um, at all times uh, when you're going into a city um, and this stuff kind of stuff is happening. That's Fairly common sense things, but at the same time, it's, you know, they're, they're things that they don't openly teach people. You don't see that stuff on the news. So, <laughs> no, you don't. And a lot of what you were saying, you don't also see in YouTube videos and fancy flashing Instagram videos. You, uh, you know, this yep. is more of the trade craft type of thing that a guy like you learns over a long career. Yep. Uh, and that, you know, that's the stuff that's going to save your life. It's not yep. this to cha, chop them up stuff. Yep. It's, this absolutely. absolutely now you must have gone through some defensive driving evasive driving in your time yep yep a is little there bit, anything yep. that you could just kind of off the top of your head give us as far as that goes um um what the biggest one is keep distance between okay. you and the, and the vehicle in front of you you know uh especially in cities people really like to to ride each other within like a half vehicle distance yourself a vehicle, vehicle and a half, two vehicle distance between people. If somebody wants to kind of sandwich in there because they're driving like a dickhead or whatever, let them, you know, yeah. just back off a little bit. Just keep that distance so that you're easily more able to maneuver around them, turn around, uh, back up, get up over a sidewalk or, or a median if you have to, things like that. That's, that's, that's probably the biggest thing there that I can recommend is just – be calm in your vehicle and keep distance between between the vehicles in front of you. You know, that's a really great piece of advice. Uh, I've been involved just due to the fact of where I live. Big city. I've been involved with a couple of road range incidents in my time. Never the aggressor, always kind of the, you know, yeah. <laughs> the defender. So it's always when a guy pulls around and pulls right in front of you, right? Or it's when a car is going really slow and you're kind of inching up and they stop and they get you and there's nowhere to go. Yep. that's when you get ambushed, assaulted, attacked. Yep. So keeping a good distance would really be yep. very smart. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, you don't want to be, what's it called, the, the swoop and squat. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah, where they where they come up on you and then slam on the brakes. To A lot of the time they do that for like insurance fraud stuff. But, I mean, same principle when it comes to ambushing and things like that too. And, and again, you know, with, the, with, with foot traffic areas too and things like that, you know, uh, in, in a – really congested downtown area, you know, you really just try and avoid them. Just try and avoid them. That's, that's really what I can say. Kind of the essence of executive protection is avoid and, uh, and go on your way, right? Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Try and try not to draw attention to yourself and uh, yeah, really, really kind of uh, go off the beaten path as much as possible. So you're not uh, allowing an opportunity for someone to really, pay attention to any uh, uh, patterns uh, that you, that might develop out of uh, having to do that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Always, always have multiple routes to be able to move and things like that. Yeah. So in addition to EP work you've done, I'm assuming uh, private investigation, surveillance work, stuff like that. Uh, as, as far as the, the PI, the PI work, um, 
some surveillance more more on my side i actually do a lot of like client consultation for him um or, or for that company um it's it's one run by uh, an ex navy guy a uh, good buddy of mine um and i work for him like per diem a little bit um so a little bit of surveillance it, more on my side it's i do i help with some uh, media production when he makes commercials and advertisements and stuff i do client consultation um and then i do uh analyst stuff so i help with uh, I help with uh, checking uh, like CCAPs, like your circuit court background check stuff, um, NICS type checks for background checks and stuff because they offer those services. Um, and then I help analyze photo and video after it's been taken uh, by the primary investigator um, to help, you know, clear up images or, or, or blow up a portion of an image or, or uh, help help edit down video to the content that really matters for an investigation, things like that. That's a lot of what I do for him. We also do a little bit of executive protection too, um, uh, protective services uh, with that company as well. Um, that's not too often though. And uh, being that that company is based out of Florida and I don't live anywhere near Florida, it's kind of hard for me to uh, kind of get back and forth for that. Um, even though he does operate in other states and is certified, we're certified in like the, the Virgin Islands and stuff too. Um, uh, yeah, we don't, we don't really go down there too often. And so um, I just kind of help him on the side like that. Um, but I've been doing that for a couple of years. So a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, blowing up license plates and, mm -hmm. and <laughs> clearing up, clearing up video footage for him and things like that. So it's really interesting stuff though. I mean, when you, when you, there's a lot of time spent uh, between in surveillance and and the uh, the analysis afterward. There's a lot of time spent just sitting there and just just getting all these patterns of uh, of, of movement, of behavior, of of whatever. Apart from any any damning activity that that is caught to to help build the case and and give it to our clients. So building up a pattern of an individual or individuals' lives like that. I yeah. could assume would be very important um, for any kind of intelligence work, but specifically what you would be doing, which is, you know, private investigations. When is, when is he going to come over to her house or whatever? Yep. 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 A lot of that are like, Hey, I know that this guy goes to the strip club every Wednesday or whatever it is, you know? Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's that kind of stuff. You, you know, you, you have the initial tailing and surveillance and stuff. And then the, the pattern just kind of, shows itself after a little bit and you, you can you can time how you want to do your investigative activities around what their pattern is um a lot of the time you know some people are obviously a lot sneakier and craftier but yeah. um most people are creatures of habit like that so <laughs> you know it's easy to be able to just kind of kind of show up where you need to and get some photos and stuff so it always amazed me how little your general joe six pack looks in the rear view mirror Mm -hmm. A lot of people just never do that. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what I mean, of, uh, what you do as an EP officer, EP agent, um, I would assume would involve surveillance awareness, counter surveillance. Yep. Absolutely. There is, there is some of that. Um, now with, with a lot of the executive protection that I do for private, like business people and, and clients and stuff, it's a real small scale team stuff maybe one or two of us mm -hmm. doing protection de details for these guys, depending on how many principals and clients we have in one place at one time and things like that. And then coordinating with uh, other EP teams for, for other uh, principals and things like that. Um, but a lot of the time it was just, it was just me and maybe one other dude, yeah. you know, from time to time. So you really, you really have to up your game with that kind of thing. And, and that's where uh, changing up your pattern, especially when it comes to movement uh, places of meeting uh, and the times they're in and things like that really come into play just as much as uh, uh, apparel, you know, cause I mean, business people, they're going to wear suit and tie a lot of the time. When you go to a country like Colombia, uh, that may not be the best outfit to wear. So, <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes I would have to tell a client, be like, Hey, I understand this is a business meeting or you're going to meet with some investors or whatever, but uh, you know, this place may not be the best place. It may not be the best to wear a suit and tie, you know, yeah. uh, wear, wear something a little more, a little more casual and uh, something that'll help you kind of uh, 
look more like a just a normal cruise tourist or or uh, more like a local in a lot of ways you know and and actually I, I i had pulled some equipment out before sometimes i would wear just a normal photographer's vest mm. make myself look like a uh, like a uh, ne- like a national geographic photographer you know have a camera mm. and all that stuff have a vest obviously i'd have some tools and trinkets in it you know um and whatnot but i'd also have normal like you know uh, stuff you would have as a as a photographer in there too or as a tourist or whatever just to kind of make yourself not not stand out so much you know be like oh hey this guy isn't isn't somebody that we're going to want to kidnap and hold for ransom you know so the employing those those physical kinds of tactics are, are just as important as uh as as knowing what your threats are in the area and how best to kind of you know uh, switch things up so i think it's really interesting that you mentioned that so you know a lot of guys think about a bodyguard quote unquote rocking a pair of 511 uh pants and uh like a a snazzy polo shirt you know with aviators or whatever the oaky sunglasses but they don't think about going undercover so to speak i mean you didn't want to stand out as the bodyguard and you sure shit don't want your client to stand out as right. a wealthy individual so right exactly yeah as far as like your tactical gear and your 511 and everything i mean you can see a lot more of that with your standard pso pss positions when you're on a contract like in the middle east in baghdad on a base or whatever you know that's that's where that's appropriate and sometimes with disaster response like um with uh, some companies uh, going down to Puerto Rico and Haiti after the hurricane and stuff, wearing that equipment is appropriate. You know, you want to stand out, look official, know that, you know, A, you're there to help people, but also that, you know, B, the other people that you don't want you to, you know, don't want to mess with, you let them know that, hey, we're here to, you know, take care of business. Yeah. So that's when that's appropriate. But absolutely, I mean, uh, when it comes to executive protection, like in the music industry, there were times where it was a black tie affair, you know, so yeah, I'd be, you know, in, in a suit or whatever. And then there's other times, especially when it came to like the electronic music DJs and stuff and working with those management agencies, I dressed like I was uh, a kid in the crowd going mm. to the show, mm. you know, uh, and then, and then that way I didn't stand out like that. And I just looked like I was there to, to attend the concert. And then uh, I would coordinate with the venue security and then any other outside security staff or whatever. And then most of the time I would just hang out in like the VIP area or, or whatever, kind of helping with the access control to that. And then uh, kind of being off, off, off the side stage, you know, when the artist was performing and things like that, you know, just being there ready to, you know, ready to handle whatever. So um, yeah, just, just little nuanced things like that, what you're wearing can, can matter so much when it comes to that kind of thing, you know, whether you're the client or, or the, the person doing the, uh, protective uh, service. So two questions here. Uh, I'll sure. start with this one. Cause I'm sure it's on everybody's mind first and then we'll follow up from there. Now, what percentage of the time are you armed while you're doing this work? Um, so executive protection, um, when it came to the music industry stuff, uh, probably about 50% of the time mm-hmm. when it came to private business client stuff, hundred percent of the time. Mm-hmm um pso pss stuff 100 percent of the time um you know always always armed in some way or another um you know so (laughs) kind of have to be um especially with like the you know business clients i mean we're going to mexico and and colombia and some uh some other places like that which uh you know (laughs) people get snatched up in a heartbeat what's that it can be a little tricky i'm assuming um you know being armed in a foreign country Yes. Uh, yeah, that can be tricky. So um, if you're fortunate enough, which on a, a couple of times I was, you know, the, our, our, the principal has their own jet and flies into a, a private a private airport or whatever, you know, so you don't really have any customs to worry about or anything like that. So you can bring kit with you. Um, other times you have to acquire kit when you're there, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, a country like Honduras, for example, you know, every every weapon that is, that's in that country is registered. Uh, yeah. with the government yeah um and the and the local government uh, offices so you know there's 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 things like that that you really do have to take into account you know um africa obviously a much different theater sure. um 
with with that kind of thing but yeah south america i mean it's still it's still easy to get a, get a firearm and, and whatever other equipment you may need in a lot of central and south american countries it's mm -hmm. just there's a different way that you have to do it so mm -hmm. now i would assume also lord forbid you ever had to use it uh it would be important to get yourself and your client kind of out of country very quickly yep absolutely uh, yeah always and that goes that goes back to that route planning which is a big one uh what what are the quickest three quickest ways to get from where you are to the airport or wherever you're going, you know, um, to, to get out of there or segue point to get to another vehicle and then move on from there kind of thing. So no, no less ever than, than three different, three different uh, routes to, to work with, to uh, kind of, kind of best, best have that plan in place. Um, yeah. <laughs> Eyes in Excellently to my next question, which would be about the advanced work. I mean, when you're taking a wealthy client overseas, how much advanced preparation are you doing off the job at home uh, before you guys depart? Uh, I mean, a fair amount, a fair amount, it, it, mostly uh, map, map, map reading, topographical reading. You know, you got to understand the cultural nuances and things like that. Um you know, make sure that your principal and or or the the personal assistance of your principal or whatever has had things like the hotel booked somewhat in advance, but not like way in advance. Yeah. Um, because that just opens opportunity for uh, corrupt staff at the facility to possibly, you know, let uh, some local people uh, know that you're there, kind of thing. So. Uh, it's a very finite window of time to appropriately do that kind of thing. Um, uh, when it comes to, uh, your actual like travel booking and things like that. And then, um, yeah, just, just, just map reading, understanding your routes, uh, try to learn the language if you can, <laughs> you know, I, I speak a, a little bit of Spanish. It's gotten a little rusty, but, um, my, my German is better, but, um, uh, yeah, you know, it, have, have at least a somewhat functional touristy level of of the language understanding too to help you get by you know to be able to kind of facilitate a little bit better because i mean verbal judo is just as important as 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 the weapon on your hip you know so um being able to talk to people uh de-escalate you know ask for help whatever it is that's just as important as anything else so um there's a lot of that but i mean yeah yeah even before a, a trip like that, yeah, there's there's quite a bit of planning that goes into it, um, and understanding understanding things. And what resources the principal is providing as well, be it an aircraft or, mm. um, you know, hey, they've got they've got uh, a, a vehicle lined up once we get there, you know, and then I talk with uh, the handler down there or whatever that is hooking us up with a vehicle and things like that too. So that's you know that's another thing with with, with that overseas stuff is try to be in a non nondescript vehicle too you know don't really try and stand out with a with a vehicle either um you don't want some brand new mercedes benz rolling rolling <laughs> rolling through mexico city because that's that's gonna that's gonna throw turn some heads i mean granted there's probably a bunch of cartel guys that do that too or i say there are a bunch of guitar cartel guys that do that too you know with uh flashy vehicles but they stand out too so you don't want to stand out opposite from them because then they're like, hey, who's that guy? We don't know him. Um, yeah, you don't so, want to stand out too much in, when you're not in your own backyard. You know, yep, it's yep. exactly. That's solid exactly. Yep. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm so glad you brought up the verbal judo because I feel like that's honestly more important than knowing how to shoot like Rambo. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Verbal judo. I mean, and, and, and for anyone, anyone watching that doesn't know what that is, verbal judo is just literally the art of talking. Um, whether it's in a, in a commanding and assertive manner or in a uh, just a, a general dialogue manner, uh, in a manner in which you're trying to get information kind of in passing out of someone, not directly, you know, it, it, it encompasses all that things. It's a term very widely used in law enforcement, too. Um, I have a law, uh, criminal justice degree as well. So um, you get you get taught some of that stuff, too. But verbal judo, I mean, yeah, just especially when it comes to executive protection, like working with the music industry stuff. I mean, with, with those, with uh, doing protection for DJs and stuff. I mean, sometimes you'll get, you'll get some drunk kid that tries to get into that VIP area, you know, and you got to know how to handle them and just how to talk to them. You know, you're not, you're not going to 
just m- want to mess them up physically, you know, right off the bat, you know, and you talk them down or whatever. And it, the same goes for somebody who's, you know, bad, you know, yeah. if they don't pose a, if they don't pose like a physical threat with a weapon or anything, you know, you, you got to talk them down you got to know how to talk to them. So when that does fail though, uh, there's nothing yep. like knowing some good old fashioned combatives. Yep. What, uh, what, I mean, what have you been studying? Uh, you're obviously a guy who knows how to handle himself. Did you start learning that when you were in the army or what was your journey like? <coughs> um, even before then. Um, so in the, in the army, we, we, we have modern, modern military combatives. Um, there's a lot of ground game stuff with that. There's a lot of jujitsu kind of implemented with that along with like your more classic, uh, judo throws and things like that too. A lot of ground game though with combatives. Um, but even before that, um, my brother is a black belt in Korean combat, have keto. Uh. He taught me a little bit. And then, um, where, I, where I grew up for like high school and stuff, there's a, a large Hmong, uh, Thai and Vietnamese population. Uh. A lot of Muay Thai. So I learned Muay Thai from a couple of the guys who actually like fought Muay Thai, ba- Muay Thai back in like Thailand and stuff. So um, I got really proficient with uh, kicks and strikes and things like that. And then the military, the ground game uh, from combatives, that was really helpful. And then just kind of on my own, study, uh, studied a little bit more, uh, got into uh, studying uh, Defendo and Defend You, actually. Um you know, big history guys. So like, you know, learning about the devil's brigade and what Fairburn and all those guys are doing. I was just like, hell yeah, that's the kind of stuff I like. I don't, I don't like this, you know, you know, duke it out in an octagon and then shake hands afterwards. Like, no, like I'm here to actually fight and hurt somebody and get away from them, you know? So that's <laughs> it's eliminate the threat, for, you know? Yeah, no, a hundred percent, man. It's so <laughs> important for what you do is to maim yeah. and hurt them really bad and get the freak away as opposed to like roll around on the ground for a half hour and, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Even, even being a more like lean and kind of like, you know, uh, like skinny guy with a lot of endurance. I mean, you, it doesn't matter who you are. You get burned out being in that, being in that grapple in that ground game for more than five minutes, 10 minutes. So you want to be able to, you want to be able to induce as much damage as possible as quickly as you can and then get away, you know, or, or take them out if you have to. So <laughs> you know that's how it is um so that and that's why that's why i like muay thai you have those strikes um super super hard hitting strikes yeah um yeah, i mean they do some damage and then uh and then yeah the ground game if you need it you know that background there and then yeah the defendo and defend you is just amazing i love i love that dirty fighting because any little edge to be, stay on top you know i mean use it kick them in the balls man Kick him in the balls <laughs> all day long, man. I mean, all day long, really like <laughs> grab him, kick him, stomp him, whatever you can, just hurt the guy. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And Fairburn was, I mean, he was a judo guy. He had studied all of that martial arts stuff, and what he came out with was just that: freaking yep. stomp on his balls, hit him in the <laughs> eye, and simple and simplest stuff. Yep. Yep. And I, I really like knife fighting too. Um, um, I always have a knife on me, no matter what, even if sometimes when I don't have a firearm on me, just, just as Joe public, I always have a knife on me. So, you know, some of my, some of my favorite, some of my favorite strikes and stuff, you know, stabs in the armpit and stuff. Um, Cause I mean, you're, you're going to take them down right away. So it's just, you know, little techniques from that. And I know Defendo and Defend You, they, they do that too with the knife fighting stuff, which I love. So it's, yeah, it's fantastic. It really, it's, I mean, whether you're doing Defend You, whether you're doing Muay Thai, whether you're doing whatever it is, you really need to be, uh, I think, incorporating some weapons, like you said, and yep. especially if you're a guy like you or a G-man or whatever it may be, and you're going overseas, you know, you don't always have, like you said, you don't always have a sidearm on you. So to have right. that experience with a knife or even a pen uh, would probably be invaluable. Right. And I mean, you know, when I was in the infantry in the army, I mean, unless you're like a sergeant, some specialist, but if, unless you're a sergeant, you don't have a sidearm. Uh, so it's just a rifle, just our, you know, our grenades. I had a two or three grenade launcher on my rifle and our bayonet and then whatever other knives and multi-tools that we have and stuff. Hmm. Um, we still did bayonet training back then too. Um, I, I don't think they do much bayonet training for the infantry now in the army. So, but um, that was that was actually kind of handy. So I, 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 uh, I held on to that too. So, <laughs> you know, it really surprises me just while we're on that topic that they're not yeah. teaching the guys any bayonet stuff or really like empty rifle stuff anymore. Except <laughs> that 
I guess they teach them to push the muzzle into the chest or yeah. something, but Mu yeah, muzzle strikes. And I mean, they'll still teach, they still teach, teach like butt strokes and stuff too. Yeah. Um, but because the F4 rifle is so short, mm. it's not really advantageous to have a bayonet on it. Mm. Um, because I mean, the point of a bayonet is basically, you know, on a longer rifle, it's, it's basically your modern spear, you know, mm. you're keeping distance, but you're able to, you know, uh, uh, thrust and, and hurt and kill hurt and kill the enemy so with a with a rifle that short i mean <clears throat> excuse me they still focus you know they still do muzzle strikes and butt strokes and stuff a little bit in training but okay. um it's much more focused on you know if you're getting that close to them i mean you try and shoot them otherwise you're gonna get you're gonna be in a ground game so yeah that's that's kind of how they focus that with all that kit on you too i would assume <clears throat> it really makes you very top heavy yeah yeah, <laughs> it does. Well, even that, well, the body armor system that they use now is different from because uh, we had the interceptor IBA system back when I was in, which was even heavier. Um, and it had, had like all these like additional like shoulder pauldrons and the you guys look like knights, yeah, the groin protector and stuff. Which I mean, most of us took that shit off anyway. You know, I'd, I'd sit on my groin protector in the Humvee just to have some protection <laughs> for my balls. But, but um, I never wore that on patrol. You know, I wore my vest. I wore my neck protector if I was up in the turret, mm. you know, um, and stuff like that. But yeah, no, it was super heavy. It was super, and those were ceramic plates too, which ceramic plates nowadays are a lot lighter than they used to be. But I mean, they, they were heavy. All that Kevlar in those plates was heavy. I don't know how you guys dealt with that shit in the 120 degree heat. Like it was, it was dry heat for the most part. So, I mean, <laughs> like it was hot, but it wasn't like, it wasn't like you were in Florida, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, you had layers on, so that kind of helped keep the sun off you a little bit, but I mean, you're still sweating like crazy. Just drinking a lot of water and a lot of energy drinks. <laughs> I bet, man. That, I mean, you, you guys went through some shit out there, man. I mean, not even just with the combat, but with the heat and the fucking everything. And yep. you know what always scared the shit out of me more than even I think the terrorists would is those fucking camel spiders. <laughs> They, they're fairly harmless, thankfully. Um, but uh, the, the and there's two types of camel spiders. There's actually you can find camel spiders in Texas and Arizona and New Mexico too. Shit. Don't tell yeah. me that. Yeah, they're there. They're there. I used to live in Texas as a kid, so I mean, besides tarantulas and scorpions and rattlesnakes, there there were camel spiders. Huh. But um, they're not as they're not as uh, often seen as as in some parts of like the middle east and stuff but there's two types of camel spiders the there's like the yellow ones so those are the ones that can get really big but they're pretty harmless um and then there's these little black ones that um have a little bit more of a toxic bite to them but they're still i mean they're still like it's like whatever i mean so the it, fort benning georgia where where i trained to a station you got brown recluse spiders which are far worse than a camel spider yeah so and we had guys falling out all the time. They had to go to triage to get to huh. get uh, brown recluse bites taken care of and black widow bites to get taken care of. So, um, yeah, that, spiders as as creep as as crazy and alien esque looking as camel spiders are. They're pretty harmless compared to a lot of other things that we have right here at home. <laughs> there's a lot. Of, yeah, there's a lot of venomous stuff here. Snakes. I don't like snakes either, man. They they can really get you good. They're um, tasty. They're tasty. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose if you have to freaking do that, then, um, hey, you got to do what you got to do. Did you ever go through any uh, survival training, anything like that? <laughs> uh, no, not not with the military or anything, no. Just just kind of the, the general briefings that you get about what happens is should you get, like, separated from the unit when you're mm -hmm. overseas or whatever. But not really, like, any, like, seer survival training, like what, uh, what uh, some of the special forces guys are more fortunate and pilots are fortunate enough to go mm -hmm. through. I kind of I did a lot of that education and training kind of after the fact. Um, it was actually you had uploaded some retro training videos on your on your channel. And I was that was originally how I found you was I was watching some of those uh, retro training videos and I was like, holy shit. Um, so that was really cool. Um, but yeah, no, you know, you just kind of learn from there. Like I always keep uh, I actually have an old 1950s, 1960s edition uh army fm survival training manual i keep in my go bag okay. cool. <laughs> i mean it's old school but it, there's some great information in there that really helps you if you really get into a pinch those um, old books and videos are honestly i think better than some of the stuff i think guys are learning now absolutely yeah. absolutely uh i i couldn't 100 uh, percent agree with that you know uh, they're really especially when it comes to some of the videos that came out when it comes to like 
edible plants in this region or yeah. in the desert or whatever. Like those are super helpful, you know, apart from like how you can collect water and things like that. Um, yeah, just there are some seriously old school tips and tricks you know, learned all the way back through however many generations of civilizations. It, you know, that, that information is not going to change. So the, the fact that they trained that even back then, whether it was the 60s, 70s, 80s or whatever, I mean, yeah, no, that's great information. Absolutely. That's, um, I mean, the army, the military, man, they were, it was a different breed back then. And you know, cause you were in that last, you know, woodland camouflage club there. Yep. And uh, yep. yeah. Yep. Yeah. We were the, we were the transitional period. So went through, went through uh, infantry school, OSIT, one station unit training, 14 weeks straight. Uh, we went through that with, uh, you know, a, a combined, you know, the, the M81 Woodland BDU camouflage, battle dress uniform, old stuff. And then quartermaster refits got reissued the uh, the new ACU UCP stuff at the time. And yeah, <laughs> it was like, OK, but yeah, some of our drill sergeants were old school. I mean, uh, so I was I was in Echo 219 in our infantry school. And uh, so our senior third platoon that I was in, our senior drill instructor was a Green Beret. Um, who had fought in Kosovo and he was originally from the Greek army, which was really cool. Um, and then um, our first platoon, which was the 11 Charlie, the mortar men platoon, the senior drill sergeant there was in Mogadishu in Somalia back at the Black Hawk Down thing. So we had some drill instructors that had been serving in action in the early and mid nineties that were, were training us. And then we had some other drill sergeants that had just come back from deployments and were like, super hot ready to go all the time so yeah it was it was pretty wild it was pretty wild definitely definitely hardcore it, it, at that time it was still pretty hardcore as far as the training went yeah we hazed the shit out of each other kind of thing but uh, it's also but, hardcore like you guys were about to go into hardcore combat like it well, wasn't yeah. like okay maybe we'll see actually it was oh you're going to fucking iraq man like mm -hmm. you better learn how to do your shit which mm -hmm. is crazy Yep. And it was, yeah, it was right during the presidential election in 07 in Iraq, the Iraqi presidential election. And then uh, that was the height of the civil infighting between the Shia and Sunni uh, factions. And then you had foreign fighters, foreign insurgents and the local insurgents, you know, having to deal with. So it was, it was pretty wild. <laughs> do you see anything kicking off in the Middle East in the next five, 10 years, or do you think it's all going to kind of be out East? You know, it's interesting because, I mean, uh, Dash or ISIS, whatever you want to call them, I call them Dash. Um, the Dash are still a threat to an extent, you know, in Syria and, and in parts of Iraq and stuff. So that still has to get kind of nipped in the bud still. And they're trying to stretch their influence in competition with like Al-Qaeda and stuff in Africa, mm -hmm. um, which is what we're seeing with uh, like Al-Shabaab and Boko Haram and stuff now. And and Dash themselves are with with their label are starting to show up in Africa as well. Um, so it really had that really has to get nipped in the bud. Um, Saudi Arabia is still in active conflict with uh, with Yemen, mm -hmm. uh, the Houthi rebels in Yemen. Um, and I want to say the UAE and Saudi Arabia and all that. They just had a giant like defense arms expo over there uh, in Dubai and. Uh, Saudi Arabia and, and the UAE are really coming in their own with their own tech and everything now and very much so modeled after uh, West conventional Western military forces in a lot of ways. But I mean, they're they're they've uh, designed like kamikaze drones and stuff basically to help combat the issue and stuff. So, um, you know, Saudi Arabia has that has that going for them. We still have we still have uh, the dash to worry about, along with finalizing stability in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, Libya's a mess. <laughs> Libya's still a mess. They're they're still in a civil war right now. Um, everyone vying for for control and power. And then uh, and then you have Iran, of course. They they always like to try and stir stir shit up. But uh, Israel Israel's been doing a pretty good job of <laughs> keeping them on a leash. So uh, you know, uh, props to them for uh, actually uh, getting some work done. And kind of kind of keeping tabs on them, apart from us having sanctions and everything on them and the U.N. kind of uh, forcing uh, inspections on their uh, uh, nuclear energy sites and things like that. So Israel's had their hands full 
for the last six months or so. Yes, they have. Yes. <laughs> They've been busy, yeah. <laughs> but uh, hey, you know they're they're getting work done. And I mean, it's it, the thing with Israel too. It's a really weird dynamic now that Biden's in office and everything. It's a really weird dynamic as far as uh, our uh, the U.S.'s relationship to to Israel. Um, you're not hearing a lot out of the Biden administration either about um, what we're doing, you know, in partnership with them because. Yeah. It's, it's Israel and Jordan and Saudi Arabia are really our biggest coalition partners in the Middle East. So, Jordan just had some uh, domestic turmoil there as well with uh, Hamza. Yep, yep. It's yeah, everywhere, the, uh, you everywhere you turn, there's, there's something going on. Um, I want to touch, I want to circle back to China real quick because okay. this is like the real thing that we're looking at here. Um, Taiwan, man, do you think they're going to make a move on Taiwan? And, and I know we kind of talked about this a little bit yesterday, kind of in, like in chat and stuff. Um, it, it's really interesting because Taiwan does have a bit of its own uh, national defense force and stuff. And it has a lot of support backing from Australia, uh, the Philippines, the U.S., um, and some other Southeast Asian uh, coalition partners. So it would not be wise if China tried that, especially uh, from the economic side of it. I mean, China's already starting to hurt a little bit because of economic uh, impact and issues from American companies pulling out of China for manufacturing and things like that and moving to Taiwan and Vietnam and some other Southeast Asian countries for um, for their uh, uh, manufacturing and production of things like uh, computer chips and textiles and stuff. So um, and then there's even a shift to South America and Central America, even a little bit now more so. Yeah. Um, uh, for that kind of thing. But um, that's really where it's where, where it would be a big factor. Um, I mean, China just re-annexed Hong Kong again to whatever degree that is, even though ever since the British kind of let them go, they've technically been a part of China, but still had some autonomy to an extent. But you know, China's really nipped that in the bud now, um, as you've seen with the rioting and protesting in Hong Kong um with that with that issue so but we unfortunately they were just kind of given up to china um taiwan is not going to be like that it, it, there's going to be a lot more resistance to that and and that's just going to be even more even more provocation for u.s companies to pull out reinvest otherwise or uh, elsewise and for uh coalition partners in the military to really really start being uh, a little more assertive and going, hey, no, bad move. Um, Do you think that we will eventually see kinetic action with China between NATO and China? We may. Um, as, as far as like kinetic and direct action, I mean, we may. I have, a, I just have a feeling that it's going to be some idiot posted at one of those islands that they're building in the South China Sea is gonna is gonna fire off a, a, a freaking Sam or something. And that's going to that's going to spark something off almost like Tonkin Gulf back in Vietnam. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's some stupid like that might 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 cause some rifts. But um, the last I mean, at least the last 10 years, the U.S. and China have uh, had this interesting uh, intelligence, counterintelligence thing going on because we always have surveillance aircraft, um, specialized uh, radar and surveillance aircraft in the air around the South China Sea. And uh, there's videos out there actually of, of uh, from inside the U.S. aircraft, and they're picking up. You know, the, they've intercepted the Chinese, and the Chinese have intercepted them uh, through uh, radio transmissions and stuff. And like the Chinese, like are like meowing at the air crew <laughs> on the aircraft and stuff. Like the, those videos are out there, um, and it's just like what the hell? But they're they're just messing with each other, and it's that it's that it's that surveillance counter surveillance and intelligence kind of thing. Um, there's a single. Chinese warship um, that actually when RIMPAC, which is a uh, joint coalition, a big joint coalition exercise in the Pacific Ocean uh, with the U.S. and a bunch of partners, the U.S. was testing a new torpedo uh, and things like that. And um, with uh, some new like third party guidance uh, control uh, systems uh, aspects and things like that. But there's a single Chinese ship that was able to get within the uh, the uh, controlled region 
that RIMPAC was going on and they were able to uh, do surveillance and uh, even even get infrared video monitoring of them testing the torpedo and stuff. So that that aspect is always there much more than than North Korea, because, I mean, North Korea, you know, <laughs> it's North Korea. We'll just say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? I don't know who it was on the chat last night. <laughs> they said that it would be great if we could freaking uh, turn North Korea against China and just let them go at it. <laughs> That would be fascinating. Um, and it's funny because as far as travel to North Korea, China is really one of the only ways that you can get into North Korea is traveling through China to North Korea, um, besides certain allowed airline segues um, from, from a couple of other, just a couple of other airports. But China, uh, North Korea gets a lot of their military supplies and technology from China still. But there is even even with them, there's been a little bit of a disconnect from from what I have been able to see with various news bits and things like that. Um, now, North North Korea, they're really a non-issue <laughs> yeah. at this point. I mean, they're really a non-issue. They don't have a navy. They I mean, they don't they don't have anything really. Um, they're not. Yeah, they're they're not really any kind of focus. Um, apart from what, what forces we do have in South Korea, working with the South Korean forces to kind of keep them in check and monitor them and stuff. Other than that, we're, we're not going to have to have too much to deal with them. It's definitely going to be China and yeah. uh, some other places, but yeah, China, I mean, yeah, it's, it's been an interesting dynamic and escalating slowly, just escalating dynamic with, with, uh, with, with China. Um, so yeah, no, I don't, <laughs> I don't really know where it's going to go you know, in the future is how fast things are going to escalate or happen to some degree or another. But I mean, it's, it's all too apparent that we can see and hear it happening. So. Yeah. It's you, you told me two years ago today that this all would be happening. And uh, I probably actually believe you, but I, I take it with a grain of salt. Yeah. I like mean, it's, it's crazy how quick, you know, how quick some of that can just change and uh, just a couple of things can happen. Uh, a bad summit meeting of leaders can happen, you know, and, and then it just sours everything and yeah, and then other escalation from there. So, I mean, obviously every, every world leader in every country has an agenda to some extent for, for maintaining semblances of control or expanding their, their empires or whatever it is. And that's nothing new. But just now it's a lot crazier because of the technology with it and uh, uh, the, the just general intelligence that's coming along with it, too. So, And uh, that really is kind of the name of the game there is advanced warning intelligence. Um, yep. I mean, so, <laughs> you know, kind of the last thing I want to touch on here is, you know, look, we're seeing room burn right now. It's just happening, right? The the troops have crossed the Rubicon, so to speak. Yep. Any advice for guys and girls out there who uh, want to protect home and family, life and liberty? Um, kind of going over some of those points from before. Um, you know, just be smart about your movements, how you present yourself. Um, always, always having enough, uh, support for yourself and in, in provisions and being able to defend yourself and things like that. But the other big thing is networking, mm -hmm. network in your community, make sure that you're in contact with your friends and family that are nearby and to have ancillary plans where you can help get them out of a bad place or vice versa, uh, or have them help respond to you kind of thing. Um, you know, that just being cognizant of that kind of thing, just always have a plan and always keep your, your network, uh, in loop. You know, that's, that's the biggest thing. That's the biggest thing is, uh, just, just aspects of planning and, and making sure that, uh, you've, uh, you've got people that have your back and, and vice versa. So just to recap here, um, cause I was writing these down as you were saying them, Natural clothing, neutral clothing, mm. blend it yep. as much as you can, yep. lay it down. Have yep. enough supplies so if power gets shut down for whatever reason, because of an insurgency or whatever it is, you'll yep. be okay for a little while. Alternate routes. Avoid the main routes. 
avoid police stations, courthouses, things that are going to really kind of like be targets yep. of whatever it is. Yep. Um, back roads, know them, take them when you can and have a network and <clears throat> keep all of your network informed. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. hundred percent. Yep. Spoken those are, those are the big key points. Absolutely. Um, Spoken like a true pro, man, you've, I mean, you've been there, you've done it and now you are sharing what you know with us, which is much appreciated. So. I do my best. I do my best. I mean, I, I think it'd actually be cool to uh, in sometime in the near future, maybe write a book with, uh, with some people and uh, just kind of pull uh, a meeting of minds and just good common sense, just practical information uh, for people to to help the, the average Joe out. There's plenty of training manuals and other mm -hmm. uh, paraphernalia and literature out there for uh, people who are really in the industry or really, really deep into uh, those those aspects of preparedness and 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 tactics and you know military stuff and all that. There's not a whole heck of a lot out there for the average Joe who works in an office nine to five um, or even tourists. There's a couple of books out there for tourists to kind of help them with, you know, how best to uh, protect yourself and, and whatever else when you're traveling abroad. But, you know, there's not a whole lot out there. There's not the a best lot one I found so far is travel safety for Americans abroad available at gutterfightingsecrets.com. Probably the best one out there you can find, but <laughs> Hey, there you go. There you go. I told you, know, I actually, uh, no, I, I think honestly, to be honest, something. To publish that. <laughs> yeah. if, if you find a better freaking one single source information out there, I'll give you $5 out of my own pocket. How about that? Um, yeah. I think you and I should definitely talk about this because you're onto something. I, I really feel like there's not, <laughs> put it to you like this. There's a bunch of fucking bullshit out there with all titled gray man. Right. And then there's, there's not a lot of real world stuff that's condensed yep. like that. So I think you're onto something. Absolutely. I, I, I would be more than happy to write a second book with you regarding the, the, the tourism and travel safety and everything, too. That would be awesome. It's going to be um, a market coming up once people start traveling again. There we go. You know, and especially, too, because, I mean, you look at just for an example, look at look at like all the resorts in like Cancun and all that down in Mexico. Eighty percent of all those resorts are owned and run by the cartels. now. Yeah. There's some yeah, semblance think about that of for a second, guys. Just think about that for a second. Yeah, there's some semblance of protection and whatnot that they're providing to you being at those resorts and being patrons to those places and things like that. But at the same time, you know, they're very dangerous places still. I mean, the whole country is dangerous, but, they, you know, those are still very dangerous places for a tourist, even if it seems like it's safe. I can't tell you how many stories I've heard from friends that have gone down there about this happens with that and with this and with this bullshit and yeah, uh, Mexico is a high risk country. I don't care what anybody says. Yep. Yeah. I, I have to say, uh, uh, Dan Calderon, um, or Don Calderon, he, he uh, he's done uh, interviews with uh, like Vigilance Elite, Sean Ryan, and stuff. Okay. That, that was a great interview, by the way, because um, he used to be uh, Mexican special police. He throws some amazing information out there too, in so far as the deep nuances within the happenings of of Mexico and such uh, Central America. Um, highly recommend listening to his stuff too. And, and, and even kind of going back to uh, certain aspects of, of preparedness and just being cognizant and, and having some good information apart, apart from what you've written, um, you know, uh, other channels that are actually half decent uh, weapon snatcher, shooter Rugi, John Rugi, um, the guy who was on video grabbing the rifle from the Antifa guy out in Seattle. Oh, right. Yeah. He's got his own YouTube channel now and website. Um, you've done an interview with S2 Underground before. Mm -hmm. Those guys, absolutely amazing intel specialists. I cannot, they, they I cannot praise them enough. Yeah, they're yeah. they're amazing. S2 Underground is awesome. They put some great information out. Um, Black Scout Survival. They also put some pretty good information out from time to time. Uh, that that guy's pretty good uh, about kind of covering the bases and stuff. There's there's some other channels out there. Little bits of information here and there that are good to grab out. I mean, um, a lot of it's still very subjective, obviously to, to what, you know, what they want to teach, what their experience is. but you know, there's some good info out there. You just, you do have to look for it. That's for sure. 
always be hunting, always be hunting for, you know, mining for little pieces of gold and you, you will find them. So, yep. Absolutely. and you've, uh, you've definitely shared a bunch of it with us tonight. So again, thank you, man. It's been a pleasure talking with you. And oh yeah, brother. I think that honestly, we're going to have to have you back on another podcast, dude, because we're only scratching the surface as of right now. So we're definitely going to try to make that happen. Um, I'm for game. providing your schedules open. So, yeah, yeah, you know, I, it's, yeah, it's been pretty crazy right now. And especially with the, uh, the impending, uh, activities based on uh, certain events that may be upcoming, you know, it's going to be pretty, pretty hectic. So everybody fucking stay safe out there. Um, yeah. Take, take these, take these uh, elements into mind and, and just be smart about stuff and, and uh, you know, just, just, just stay out of the crosshairs of uh, these adversaries. But, um, but yeah, no, I'm totally game to come back for sure. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to having you back, dude. Um, we'll chat offline, so don't go anywhere. I uh, want to hit a couple of topics with you before we call it a night. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, please remember until next time that you are your first and last line of defense. And I will see you on the next Tactical Podcast.